Tomba 2 is a cult classic platformer on the PS1 designed for beginners that has a lot of personality. It's one of the formative games of my childhood. I come back to it more often than I thought I would, which is to say every few years or so. The game is made by a now defunct Japanese studio named Whoopi Camp, who dissolved in the year 2000 and most of their former employees went to work for a company called Access Games. The story of Tomba is pretty basic. Your friend gets kidnapped by some evil pigs. It's cartoony, and while some things did not translate well from Japanese to the full English voice acting, the game retains its charm through this. Things like how Tomba, an idiot caveman who can't swim, jumps into the ocean at the beginning of the game, or that Tomba stores all items in his stomach, alluding to the fact that he is a perfect eldritch being. The first thing that happens is that a house with a crab in it is just on fire, and there's a bunch of other events or happenstance that get a lot of love from me. This game is alive with its tone. Visually, it has a very specific style, even though the environments take the usual fire area, ice area, water area, and run with it. They also throw in a couple curveballs like Clown Village and a Haunted Forest. The Haunted Forest theme, might I point out, is a bop. The entire soundtrack is so jovial, so catchy, and so perfectly placed for each setting. The icing on the cake is that these areas are under a curse, so there's two versions of each level and each level's theme. This makes backtracking after you've beaten the bosses its own treat, but I'll get more into that later. What you have in the level design is good attention to detail, like the Doppler effect on the waterfall of the heavens. or how when you get close to dying in the active volcano they built a city in, it gets loud and burny. The Laughing Crying Forest has a strange mixture of spoopy ghosts and fruit that are... emotional. Which you can eat for status effects that function as a key to locks on certain doors. If anything, you can't say this isn't creative. Even the themed boss arenas are super cool, but the optimum strategy for bosses is, sadly, not moving around much and waiting. So it can be a little anticlimactic if you know what you're doing already. The simple platforming gameplay is very no frills, and the formula has a lot of simplicity to it. You swing and jump around with weight to your movements, and momentum often carries on objects that are springy or slippery or rounded. It's not very hard, and the controls, while a little imprecise feeling at first, make you feel very safe and confident once you get specific upgrades like the flying squirrel clothes. Speaking of upgrades, the game gives you two platforming upgrades in the form of the bird suit and the fast pants, and a weapon item in the very first area. Progression moves at a lightning speed. Areas are extremely small but dense, with small activities and collectibles like chests or life pots, even gems that serve to heighten your score for the end game. Going around and finding out how things interact or how things are used is a huge part of the experience. The first run through of any area is quick, and every return feels good, as you're only there for as long as you want to be to get things you missed with your new items. And the main quest's logical progression is tied to exploration and messing around with things in the same way everything else is. And the main way to get from one area to the next has the general rule of collecting whatever animals are in a level, while also getting a new item to move around with. This usually involves some contraption that needs animals to perform some specific task, like the crabs cutting the rope for the windmill that you toss like a hooligan, or the Kujara static explosion. I've thought since I was a kid that this scene is actually kind of messed up. Any quest that has you backtrack is always on the same path as earlier tasks, even if it's only moving a single block. Progression is so bafflingly well made in this way that even once you get to the end of the game world, you then have the item that lets you backtrack and maneuver very easily. To reiterate, because of how the game is laid out, if you stop to explore an entire area before you try to go forward, you'll end up collecting something you need later. And because of how varied item placement is, the game keeps being new every time you go to an area that you've already been in if you haven't gotten or done everything yet. In a move that is absolutely nuts to me, Tomba 2 gives the player the option to fast travel, even though the game world is compact. All of these things together give an astronomical amount of player choice. You choose what to collect, where to go, 
what side quests to do, if you want to look for hidden items, what is worthwhile to you. And this keeps the game from being frustrating in any capacity, except when it comes to the minigames. Much like a lot of games in this time period and on the PlayStation 1 in general, optional minigames to get the best stuff are a huge pain and give you game-breaking items that are only debatably worth the effort because of how late you get them. Kujara washing is tedious. Even with Taboo State, or what I like to call the speedrunner's curse, there are 10 levels of it. God, that sucked to do. There's also the minecart time trial. This is my first time ever clearing this minigame in my life. I will play this game again in a year or two. And I've always attempted this, but now I'm never touching it again. I can't understate how difficult these are. This took easily over an hour of attempts in a game that is otherwise only eight to 10 hours long if you do every other side quest. Over a 10th of my entire game experience was just this. Time limit on this is only a minute and 16 seconds. Just doing the math, that's over 50 attempts. And that's just this playthrough. I've played this game before. The reward for doing these mini games is a golden powder that makes you completely invincible and leaves the only way you can get a game over as falling into a deep dark abyss. It has a cool trail effect once you unlock it that's always there to show you did it, but is this worth it? Not especially. Tomba 2 does have its small drawbacks. If you're looking for a legitimate platforming challenge, you're out of luck. And sadly, I do find myself wanting more jumping around and using items in a stringent setting. There's also the UI, which is at times a little too simple. In the start menu, there's its own status screen, but I feel like all of this information could have been put in the game's main UI. Some could argue less is more, but I would prefer to at least see status effects on the life bar, as this is a core game mechanic. Tomba 2 has left me hungry for a sequel since I first played it. A game that is just more of the same would be a godsend. Never mind if it fixed extremely small nitpicks. With my only complaints about this game coming by, am I trying really hard to find some? And by doing optional content that makes you invincible anyway, what do I really have to say except that you should try this short and sweet platformer for yourself? I'd really appreciate it if you take the time to like, comment, subscribe, you know the drill. I also like to give a shout out to all of my patrons. You can become one yourself and get access to a few exclusive behind the scenes bits, announcements, or maybe even catered content if you want me to cover a specific title. You can find this at the link in the description. You may also consider a one-time donation to me on Coffee, so I can continue to do what I do if you have no interest in a month-to-month -month format. You can find my other reviews in a playlist on my channel. Thank you so much for watching and have a good one.